Margarita recap time. It's December the 8th of 2021. Yeah! Oh, yeah! New yeah. year, almost upon us. Almost. Oh my god, time moves on unceasingly. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be tamed. Why would you want to tame time? Because, I don't know. Look. Uh, Nick, excuse me, if I was a Pokemon trainer, I can catch Dialga, who is the master of all time. And as such, I can rule it. That's a good point. Yeah. Can, in fact... It. You can train it, so to speak. I mean, and give I it can, easy I, I, items. I can send it to fuck Ditto. Nothing's gonna come out, but I can send it to the farm to fuck Ditto just over and over again. <laughs> like just let those kids go crazy. If you send two Pokemon to, I don't know if I should <laughs> go for it. We've started it. <laughs> If you send two Pokemon to the daycare that are not compatible in terms of having a baby, does that mean you're just sending them there to shoot porn? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> How does that place make money if not? They stop charging you after a while, you know? So eventually... Oh, the... a free service, but it is also sexually exploited. <laughs> I want to make clear. Every Pokemon does it consensually. There's nothing to listen about it. Good taste? Yes, that's in question. Absolutely. 100%. But everyone's there to have a good time. I want that to be clear. It says they don't like each other very much. Didn't say they wouldn't fuck each other. A little hate fucks between Pokemon is fine. Oh, meanwhile, like, if they do have, like, a baby together, they, like, pull out the sheet with the hole in it for the Pokemon. <laughs> oh, my. All right, we're off to a great start. Okay, so that has almost nothing to do with the manga that we're talking about this week. But not not nothing, as copulation is an actual mechanic in this series. Ah, uh, yeah. So <laughs> the series we're talking about this week is Hell's Paradise, Jigoku Raku, by Yuji Kaku. Uh, the one of the reasons that. Uh, Chris, you named for us uh, taking on uh, this recommendation was because Yujikaku uh, recently started up a new series in Weekly Shonen Jump, which appears uh, called Ayashiman, which appears as though it, I mean, we're, we're four weeks in to be clear, but it looks like it has gotten a good amount of attention. It's probably going to have at least a little bit of a run, but we'll see. Um, and so we decided, you decided as a result of that, hey, this is a great time for us to talk about this series that they had before, mm -hmm. which, uh, has been, had been running for several years. Uh, this was running in Shonen Jump Plus, uh, from, uh, 2018 through 2021. And, um, yeah, it's written by the same guy. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, <that's laughs> It's it's different in some ways, but like in terms of the way that it looks and uh, some of the mechanics and the general like, you know, ultra violence kind of thing that goes on in it. Yeah, same guy. It's just that it was able to go more hardcore with the stuff that it could get away with because it was, I think, just on like their online app. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I took this thinking I was a big smarty smart pants. Because I was like, this is a series that I can read for free via Shonen Jump. I could just use the app to read it. Uh, uh, no, no, this series has enough bare breasts in it that uh, Apple was like, no, 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 not on my app, you can't. So uh, part of the reason it took so long to get this recommendation out is because I had to use the hellscape of the mobile desktop version of the Shonen Jump app. Which, um, for lack of a better term, is dog shit <laughs> and uh, extremely unpleasant to read upon. There's an app for a reason. It's a great app. Yeah. The mobile version of the desktop sucks. I'm just going to be clear. 
It's almost like it wasn't intended to be used. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's some <laughs> Jeff in his room or something like that. A little light went on that said someone's using the desktop mobile version of the app. What the fuck? <laughs> he's also got uh, a light that says somebody's just pirating the manga, but he's unplugged that long ago. It's just constantly <laughs> lit up. It burns out. It's, it takes out it's, all of his electricity. It's buried in credit card bills for all the gotcha games he's he's been pulling on. <laughs> Oh, uh, so we read this, and yes, it is it is unashamedly a series for adults only, mature audiences, nudity, swear words, blood. Um, and um, this is, at first glance, first, 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 I should say, glance, like when I basically started, started, started reading this, I was like, oh no. Yuji Kaku only knows how to write one protagonist <laughs> because our main character, Gabimaru, is so strong and he's been so strong for so long that, he, that nothing can kill him, even though he wants to die and he's so bored with everything. Well, it turns out that that is not actually his character at all. That is simply uh, his reputation and the fact that he puts on a facade for everyone. The truth is that he has this long reputation as this horribly infamous ninja assassin guy who literally is such a good ninja that he has superpowers you know as as you do uh -huh. uh, and he is so skilled that he just will use ninjutsu seemingly even without willing it to happen the real reason is even if he says oh i i really would just like to die because i'm just kind of bored of living and i i, I don't really want to live anymore but i'm just so good no, he actually has a very good reason to live, which is that there's someone that he loves and who loves him. He's married, and he's trying to make his way back to his wife. He was cast into prison, uh, and so he's staving off his execution so that he can hopefully one day get back to her. And an opportunity for that arises when he basically is tasked with going to find the Fountain of Youth, basically. Uh. Uh, and uh, there is this plot by the government to send all of these death row inmates to try and find this uh, will make you live forever potion. And uh, from this very, very dangerous place where they have sent out scouts and none have returned safely. They've gotten had one scout come back and he's gone insane and most of his body has turned into plant matter. He's been yeah. perfectly transformed. So there is this bizarre place that they have to go to, and each inmate uh, is accompanied by an executioner. It's a great idea. I just... I... <laughs> it is one of the most bizarre premises, because they're like, we want you guys to go to this island. Uh, you're all criminals, and you'll receive a pardon if you do this. But to make sure, because you're criminals, that if you start uh, betraying us, we're going to send along uh, an executioner, one for each, each of you, who will decapitate you should you right. go off the chosen path. But then they specifically put in rules to make the criminals fight each other. Yeah. And then they also kind of like go in knowing like, eh, man, the criminals aren't going to follow these rules. Right. They're going to go off the bat. So then right. it makes some of the decisions for the people they send, like they send along nerd bot, <laughs> like at one point, like the nerdy swordsman who eventually you find out like, Oh, he's rank five or whatever and stuff like that. But like most of it, he's kind of like, the cowardly nerdy member of the group. And you're just like, how did you get approved to this? Like it really boils down to like the questionable decision to be like, yeah, this is a solid play. Like why even send the execute or the, uh, the executioners along? Why not just send Ted Grunel yeah. and say, go for it and come back or die yeah, on this Island. I mean, you could just send all the death row inmates, death row inmates there, and then just have people like patrolling the perimeter of the Island to make sure that if any of them get off, then they, then they confront them and see if they've got it and they'll kill them if not. Yeah. But yeah, you are just kind of sending all these executioners in and being like, yeah, most of those very useful employees of ours are going to die. <laughs> Cause it's, it, it also, the ones that don't are probably going to become pretty disillusioned to our job. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to think, I'm like, I guess there's like one that isn't a complete, like like pretty much as soon as they hit the island, almost every single one of them betrays their 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 duties. Like all of them are like teaming up with the inmates and shit like that. Like it does the the premise doesn't last very long. And I'm like, 
don't know, it's just a very amusing thing once you see like some of them show up and you're just like, man, this really this wasn't a thought through plan at all. Especially when it's like, hey, I got this like, I don't know, like six foot strong dude. He's gonna execute this like twelve foot giant. <laughs> You're like, oh, can you, can you, can you just bend over so I can chop your head off? Yep, come on. It's one of those moments you're like, I feel like maybe we should have thought this one through a little bit more on how to quickly execute these people. Uh, Gab Gabimaru is accompanied by a young, talented, comes from a great lineage of executioners, mm, uh, but uh, also is quite inexperienced herself. A uh, swordswoman named uh, Sagiri, uh, and so Sagiri, who is a woman, by the way, has all of these insecurities, which keep on manifesting as doubts that literally try and molest her very supple body. And uh, look, so here's the thing. Here's a, one of the things that stands out to me about this series. On the surface, this is. You know, a kind of thing where, like, oh, how do you how do you get people to go and see, you know, an R-rated film that's, you know, an action thing? Oh, it's a bunch of convicted criminals that are stranded on an island, and they you know there. It's it's, it's Stone survival. Cold did it exactly. Stone Cold did a movie that was literally this premise, except they weren't trying to find a fountain of youth, or maybe they were. I didn't watch that movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it might have been in there. We don't know. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn! I gotta get this away from Palm Stanley Young. <laughs> Oh, that'd be you if fucking The Condemned or whatever that stupid movie was had Ponce de Leon as the secret bad guy. <laughs> that immortal son of a bitch. <laughs> okay, like, like, wasn't it like a reality show being streamed to people? Wasn't that yeah, half the gimmick? Right. <laughs> Just like people at home be like, was that Ponce de Leon? <laughs> He's still alive? Stone Cold gets to the Fountain of Youth and of course he double fists it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Misses the first one, flips off the dude, grabs another one. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, they gotta go and kill each other and stuff. All right, so it's a bunch of these murderous assholes, convicted mass murderers, the most evil people on the planet. They've got no reason to work together. They all just want to get out of this place alive. But what it turns out is, instead of a bunch of battle-hardened, crime-committing murderers, it's just a bunch of horny dickheads who are on this island trying to compete with each other to be the horniest and the dickiest head it there's so much weird sex stuff that happens in this <laughs> difficult every time that look there's nip slips all over the place that just make no sense to me okay when her why does she think of herself as just stuff groping her when she feels the slightest bit bad about something i just so i i i couldn't get into this okay out, out of curiosity how far were you able to get into it i can't actually tell you because I, I i i feel like there's a portion of it where i know the point you're talking about when the series first starts it is relatively unpleasant and the best way i can describe it is remember the first part of the hunter exam and hunter hunter where they're just let loose in like the wilderness and there's a bunch of monsters and shit that just eat them like to just eat people who are idiots that kind of felt like the entirety of this manga like you just threw a fucking a couple buddha and like taoism references in there yeah. and that's pretty much it for like the first 20 or so chapters like it's it's not unpleasant i should say but it, it has definitely an unpleasant atmosphere around it and it takes a while for you to even understand like who the fuck are the characters in this like i obviously got me morrow is and executioner lady i'm sorry i don't know any characters in this series <laughs> <laughs> but like everything else it's like a cut to of different people getting killed and you're just like yeah was i supposed to care about them who are they and then it cuts to someone else you're like oh i guess they're dead now too or something like that or like oh i guess the beach isn't safe either and it's not until after you get past like that 20 chapters that like you start establishing who are actually characters in this and it takes a while to actually get there before you're like, Oh, there's a cast now. It's, it's not just two people and a random assortment of people. I don't know getting murdered by monsters. The series is 13 volumes long. I read, I want to say a quarter of that. Okay. Okay. That's too many for the plot to kick in. <laughs> it, it's, 
I will say this. I I'm good. I'm definitely going to say I like the series more than you do. Um, but I can understand where you're coming from because I I, I think the initial impression of the series is rough. Um, there's parts of it I still like back then, but I find that the more time these characters are given to develop, the more you start to like them. And eventually you start getting characters who like stick around and characters join groups and you start finding out more about this island that makes it a little bit more interesting. It's not enough to be like, oh, this is a fascinating series, the likes of which I will treasure in my heart forever. Um, but I, I do think it is, it is interesting enough that once I got past that like initial 20 chapters, I was more interested in turning to chat, like reading the next chapter after I finished. Like, okay, let's see what happens next. Hmm. I think that my problem with this series was not even a matter of there being unpleasant stuff, because if I want to, I can very easily numb myself to that. It was that in the first chapter, I thought that we had what looked like it would be an interesting dynamic with uh, Gabimaru, uh, the seemingly immortal guy, and then the one person who actually seemingly can kill him. Uh, who is going to accompany him, but she's also kind of the only person who really understands him. Uh -huh. And that is very interesting, is that she sees him, he sees who he is, uh, and it has to do with, honestly, it doesn't really make sense, but it's just, you try to just have to buy into it in terms of the way that the executioners are treated in this series, which is not as executioners, it is as, you know, like a very pseudo mystical group of warriors and the philosophy that Sigiri approaches execution with is in fully understanding the target so that she can grant them a perfect painless death mm. which is an, an ideal that she strives towards because her father embodied that that was how skilled that he is slash was I can't even remember if he's alive or not uh, <laughs> at 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 the art of execution. So, but she's not there yet. She's still striving towards that. But at the beginning, she shows that tremendous promise because she cuts through all of Gabi Maru's bullshit. She, he like in has a vision of himself being beheaded. Like there's a moment where you realize like, Oh my God, this girl really, really could kill me. Uh, when he's been like just bored by like having bombs go off in his face up until this point and stuff. Um, and so when this series did very, very initially start off, I was like, okay, I can get into this. And then it gets incredibly generic for that, like, 20 chapters after that. There's some interesting occasional imagery in terms of, okay, well, we've got, you know, these, like, religious references and stuff. The Fountain of Youth thing just makes me think that... Uh, just reminds me of, like, the Tree of Life thing, where it's like, oh, hey, you know... The key to life is not eternal life is not what you expect it to be. It turns you into trees. I was like, all right, whatever. It's I, I, I kind of feel like that that's the point, but I did not stick around long enough to determine if that is in fact the, the case. I was gonna say there's there's definitely twists that go on regarding the actual elixir and things like that. Fair enough. But beyond that, we have these people who are you know. They're kind of unhinged in some cases. They're all very dangerous. And there are little things that you're given that I think are meant to evoke certain reactions that I found myself not really having. Um, the first time that Gabimaro and S Sagiri uh, form an alliance of any sort in this series is when they come across this, uh, this Kunoichi, whose name escapes me. Um, uh, oh, she's Usuria. I only know that because it's another person's name for another right. manga read. <laughs> <laughs> Very different Usuria. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're about one for one. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So Usuria, being a Kunoichi, is this seductress. She uses her sexual uh, wiles to uh, entrap and uh, bend people to her will to extract information from them and or to lure them to a false sense of security and to kill them. We see that she she tells us that she got into a conflict with one of the other people who was who came to this island, and uh, that guy ended up dying. And she's lying about the way that things went down. 
everyone's very obviously like, yeah, you're 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 lying. You're like always lying. And I'm pretty sure that the thing you just described isn't what really, really happened. So it really did happen. And she says something very innocent along the lines of like, oh, you know, he he sacrificed himself so that we could, you know, for the good of the mission or whatever. And we just like cut to what actually happened, which was that she like performed experiments on him to see how everything worked. And you see his body is all messed up by being partially turned into plant, being stabbed in various places and stuff. And you're supposed to, I guess, be like, oh, holy shit. But again, they've been telling you the whole time. Yeah, you can't trust her, and she's a very dangerous Kuduichi who uses her sexual wiles in order to kill people. So the fact that she had done that was not at all a surprise to me. So, uh. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a thing where there's half the cast are these criminals who, and everyone, you know, in, in pretty much every case, except for Gabi Mara, we're meant to assume, yes, these are bad people. Like, these are criminals right. who have done bad things. Uh, and even Gabi Maro is kind of like we're 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 accepting that this guy did these bad things, but has a wife and now he's a good person now. Um, and then she the, tells him that it's bad to kill. Yeah. So therefore, <laughs> we'll get to that. I, I want to. I, I do want to get to that. Um, and then the other half is like this warrior cast of uh, of of special executioners, and half of them just suck ass in uh, actual talent. And then also a personality. They just, they, they right. fucking blow. Um, so it, it is a weird case where, like, for a portion of the series, you're just kind of rooting for the island <laughs> in a way. Like, you don't like anybody. It's not a good start. I but I, I will say, I, I'm going to, again, I'm going to say, I, I, I feel differently in this series than you do. I eventually came around to liking a lot of the characters. Even, like, Yuzuri, who, as you mentioned, uh, there is a scene where she has this deep connection with one of the executioners who is dying and she basically helps to kind of like comfort him on the way out. And I was like, this is like, this is not a moment that I'm going to treasure in my heart for the rest of my life. As I, you know, go about like a story I'll constantly think upon for the lessons it's taught me about life. But I was like, in the moment, this was an enjoyable little side character relationship. And I enjoy how this went down. So I'm able to appreciate that and say, I, I did like little moments we get from these characters. I do feel that they get more fleshed out and they become more interesting. Um, I will also say that this series probably could have used some funny characters. Because I will say that's one of the few things... Like, I, 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 I think Yuzuriha is supposed to be the funny character. She, she is supposed to be funny to, to a certain extent. But there's there's not a ton of comedy. Like, there's also... I forget his name. Uh, but the guy who's missing one hand. Uh, he is also right. kind of funny because he's just such a, I don't know a term for the character beyond he's such a Zaraki who's just crazy powerful and blows things up that like his reaction to everything is kind of funny because he just, he's so extra. <laughs> he seems to be so unanchored from the reality of the world <laughs> where he's just like, hey, it's this 700 foot tall monster with like hands and a big tongue that's going to crush us and they'll like cut it in half and be like, what monster? And you're just like, okay, this dude's fucking crazy. Um. <laughs> There's characters like that, but, like, specifically I'm thinking to uh, Sigiri, I guess is her name, who yes. I think her story actually does become more interesting as they start to focus on her character development of what she's ultimately looking for and accepting her weakness as also part of her strength because she's very much a female character in this male-dominated world. And everyone's like, you should get out of here and carry on the lineage of your family. You are not a warrior. You're not as good as anybody else. Being a woman makes you weaker and eventually finding, no, she is actually as strong as these guys. She just has to accept this part of her that she's been desperately trying to avoid. Like, that's a part of this entire island is accepting a part of yourself. I was like, I like this character. I like her developments. She is missing that one layer that would make her a more interesting character. And that layer is anything fucking human or relatable. <laughs> like, I, I like a layer that would be a little silly. Or a little goofy. She is such a stick in the mud character that I like. I appreciate when she gets her cool battle scenes, and every other scene where she's not in the fight, I just my eyes kind of glaze over when she talks because yeah. I'm like, ah, I just wish you had like something <clears throat> entertaining to do right now. As part of the you know idealistic side of her, that you know even when it's incredibly impractical and not pragmatic to still be following the directions that they were given. She's still following them. Like, Gabi Maro gets into a fight with monsters, and she's like, no, you have to keep your hands bound. 
Like, it's, 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 it's that would that would that that would at least been more amusing if she was such an over the buried stickler of the rules to that point she where just it's like people around with handcuffs. No, <laughs> you're like no. There's monsters here. Who will kill us, please. Go get your head off. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I feel that way about a lot of the characters in the series. Is that there's really not much that's fun about them. It's I think that it's kind of going very much for that like oh this is you know a mature rated thing and that everything is very grotesque and uber violent and stuff. But you know you can have you know that kind of thing and still have stuff where it's just like silly or yeah. Well, yeah, in some way, in some way, relatable beyond Gabi has got a wife that he wants to get back to. So it's it's kind of interesting to me because I I think the part of the series I found myself getting most interested in is also the part that revealed one of the bigger weaknesses of the series is when they finally reveal this this Lord Tenson character, which you come to find out is not a character. It is actually sort of a collective consciousness of several other characters who are all bound together to create the mythology of this island. And you start meeting these characters, and every single time I met one of them, I was like, I don't know who you are. Like, <laughs> they all had such easily, like, it's partially the art in this series is a little choppy, which I don't think is an issue, but some of the character designs blended together so much that when the character showed up, I was like, I, I think that's a member of Lord Tenson, but I, I don't know. And then one of them has a big fight, and I'm like, I don't remember which one that was. <laughs> like, like, the character dies, and then, like, other characters show up. I was like, is that the same one who died before? Like, I, I completely missed the part where they all had, like, distinguishing personalities and things like that. So... Now, having said that, does that then make you feel more positively about Ayashiman? Because say what I will about it. Um, but it's definitely got no shortage of weird goofiness to it. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I I, I I so far have been reading Ayashiman and liking it a lot. As I said, I read this series and the further I got into it, the more I started to like it. Like I started to find myself invested. So I think it does bode well for Ayashiman. If I'm like, once we could start cutting to the core of these characters, I think I think we can address that because it, it definitely is something that they have. Like, they do address Gabimaru's kind of boring character trait at the start. Like, he was a killer who has a wife who said, stop killing now. And he did it. And I was like, all right, yeah. that was like, that was kind of like a late nineties, early two thousands trope to do like black cat, Rory Kenshin, like, Oh, I met this woman who told me to stop killing. And I did. And then she herself is such a nothing burger character, um, which is kind of the case in this series, but they do kind of examine portions of that story and, and explore it. So I feel like, with the main character of Ayashimon, whose name I still don't remember, I feel like at some point we are going to start to explore whether or not this guy is able to examine, like, oh, I use jump as an escapism and a justification for the things I like. I feel like we're we're going to address it in some way at some point. We'll see. Um, yeah, I guess that's. I think that that's about all I have to say about Jigoku Raku. So it's a half recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will give it a recommendation. Uh, if you read a lot on the desktop, it's great. If you read, if you're like me, you read primarily through mobile. Uh, I, I can't even say pick up the volumes because you can't access the volumes through the app either. You have to get like buy the physical ones. I guess I don't know. I had to experience the same thing too, where I was like, "No, oh, sucks to suck." I guess <laughs> I opened up that desktop app or desktop version. <sighs> well, I've just got the desktop version open on my desktop, so I think that that'll work out a lot better now. Yeah, as we get. Into the recap portion of Weekly Manga Recap. We are going to kick things off as we normally do with My Hero Academia. Chapter number 336. Villain. With the uh, popularity poll results color page. Oh, is that what they are? Yeah. Is this that, is, this is, the is that why they're all those dudes on this? <laughs> Yes. Uh, and it was amusing to me because I was like, oh, yes, Bakugo, uh, Deku. Oh, and there's uh, Kirishima beneath them. And I was like, 
no, that's Kirishima over there. That must be Kaminari. I was like, no, that's not Kaminari. And I didn't know who it was. And then someone was like, oh, that's a movie exclusive character. And I was like, I guess I better memorize their face before we do the next <laughs> My Hero quiz. Because Nick will be like, he was in the popularity poll page. He was he in the counts. top ten. He was in the top ten. I can't, look, you can't name one of the top ten most popular characters. <laughs> Honestly, there, there have been some Naruto top ten character results that I looked at. I was like, who the fuck is that? So oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, there was, I know, some amount of bemoaning the fact that no female characters are in this space. <laughs> it's a little brutal when you're like, fucking All Mike or whatever his name is, Present Mike, whatever his name is, <laughs> fucking makes it. Well, Present Present Mike has, yes, his share of fangirls, be especially because the shit between him and Aizawa is actually very, very popular. Uh -huh. But like fucking movie character and not Uraraka or or sue you or fuck Jiro. there's 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 one recently i'm trying to think of oh no it is in this it is in the you won't see the full results here but in the the, the full character results mirko ranked beneath mustard <laughs> and you're like how did a character who has not shown up since he was defeated in his one-off fight, defeat one of the main characters at the start of the big war arc. <laughs> like, it turns out those buff bunny girl fan uh, fan people don't uh don't push enough votes that way. I guess. See, be, the, the, there were rumors going around uh, uh, from the most recent season of My Hero Academia, where the the League of Villains arc, you know, the, the My Villain Academia stretch, uh -huh. it was a little bit shortened. Uh, there were some scenes that were removed, and in general, it felt paced very, very strangely, and they moved around with, with the order in which it appeared in the story and stuff. So there, there was a rumor going around, like, oh, I heard it wasn't very popular over in Japan. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but it is one of those things that does that, you know, in conjunction with stuff like this, where you see these kind of poll results where I'm like, I don't know. I, I just can't. Like, I get, I, I fully understand why, like, stuff that's popular in the English speaking fan base is as popular as it is. Because at the very least, I can, like, look online and see the discourse about yeah. it. But I'm just, like, entirely separated from, like, apparently what Japanese fans of the series like about it. Because I know that, like, yeah, Uraka never fucking gets to do anything. But I thought she was at least still taught to <laughs> Not a movie character. The movie character blows my mind. But I didn't see that movie. So maybe that movie's really fucking cool. And this character's awesome. And I, I have no idea. Yeah, I guess so. Also no All Might. Which, oh. Yeah, well, his time's it's passed. Not, Get out of here, old man. He's hit that. I guess he's just not sexy anymore. No. He's too old. <laughs> that was his big issue. was never being sexy enough. Which many people will tell you has never been a problem for him uh so look i am a little too familiar with, with certain aspects of this thing. anyway the chapter itself begins with a sparring session going on as all of class 1a are training together uh bakugo is bragging about how his cluster bomb stuff works todoroki is trying to combine his hot and cold halves together uh, in a way such that he can take on Dobby without having without getting burned by his super intense flames. And Kaminari and Mineta are sitting on a bench, doing nothing. Well, Mineta's doing his thing where he keeps on plucking his, you know, great things out. It has been established that he does that for, like, endurance training, because he can only do it for so long before he starts to bleed. Uh -huh. So it does make sense that he could just go like, yeah, I'm training, I'm just sitting here. But Kaminari is just chilling, you know. He's just, he's just vibing, you know? So, Kaminari stupidly says, I know we're going to get into a big fight, but aren't the villains, like, in a really bad position right now? Because, like, Gigantomachia is, like, tied down and asleep, and, you know, All for One is in bad shape, so can't we just make quick work of the villains really easily? All right, you want, why don't you go do it then, asshole? Yeah, why don't you pop up, buddy? Mr. Big Strong uh, and Tough. And Bakugo says, 
no, you dumbass. Here's three reasons why you're wrong. <laughs> so just very, 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 they very in great detail, like just kind of lay out the situation, which the first one is very obvious. It's going to be really hard to find all of them. So how can we go and find them and kick their asses if they're hard to find? Yayorosu, who is a mind reader, or, you know, she's also just really smart and has also analyzed the situation the same way, I guess, um, is that the last time that they fought, Shigaraki's body was not complete and he still did a number on everyone. There is a really weird moment, I have to say, where they are talking about this stuff and Jiro says to someone, gross knock it off i do not know who she says that to or why hmm. i didn't read that before what well, does it show kaminari's face looking all sad there maybe that's why maybe he's just looking like more and more morose and she's like stop making that face you look weird or something or maybe it's Mineta because he he looks like he's just popping off fucking grapes and throwing them on the ground I assume that was for some part of training they weren't showing, but maybe he's just being weird and gross. Yeah, he's just, like, leaving parts of himself everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop that! <laughs> or maybe it's because Bakugo called all, all for one old nutsack face. Maybe? I don't know. Why would you with that visual? Stop that. I don't know. And I mean, goes, it is the best way to describe all for one, to be fair. <laughs> old nutsack yes. face really is the best name for him. <laughs> That's yeah. He, he is very. I quick. came. I came close to nominating Bakugo for character of the week just because I like old nutsack face so much. <laughs> uh, Bakugo then says that the third reason is that quote they're the ones with the finger on this trigger. World trigger review coming soon. Oh. Uh, because even if they don't have the search quirk, which they don't know, I, I don't know if they confirmed if he has that or hit or not. They still get to make the opening move, and that's why our side is calling up every able body we've got. I don't. I think that that's more just an extension of the first point, but he wanted to make three points. But okay. Um, Deku's hair is all messed up because he took an explosion attack to the face, so it's all kind of afro-y. So he says, "Like, okay, I better rejoin the search." And Ida chops him on the head and says, "Don't you mean weed better?" And he makes Deku's hair go over his eyes, so he looks like like a tribble or something. Yeah, he looks, anyway. he looks a little silly. He's got that silly moment, you know? Yes. Uh, so then Deku's like, oh, I gotta go for a walk for about, about something. And Ida says, yeah, yeah, I think that'll be fine because, you know, the evacuees get along with the hero course better after Uraka's stirring speech. And Uraka gets all embarrassed because, oh yeah, I got up in front of everyone and made a stirring speech. How embarrassing. But th it's kind of weird because Suyu is just like six inches away from her looking at her after Ida says this. So it kind of looks like Uraka just like, just can you just give me some space, please? <laughs> anyway, a couple of weird reaction bits as part of the chapter. Well, we're about to get into the real meat of it, Nick. This is where we get into it. Okay, so... I would just like to say... I told you. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you ever... If, I, it's straight up safe. One day, we are going to do a top ten Nick Was Right uh, podcast. And when we do, this one needs to be on there. <laughs> when, when everyone's like, oh my god, Hagakure was the spy. And I was like... Probably, but not necessarily. <laughs> It'd I be when Aoyama <laughs> wrote in cheese. We were supposed to think he was the villain. Well, it turns out we were. <laughs> so Hagakure is off by herself in the woods, and she, I think, is thinking to herself, all since all the stuff in Gunga and Jaku. You have been down in the dumps. I mean, we all felt that way, but still, I was just worried. I have to wonder why you haven't smiled once since Midoriya came back to us, giving us an explanation of why she is here to witness the scene that is unfolding, which is the reveal of the actual spy. And we see that some people are talking in 
hushed? I don't know. Voice. The word bubbles are distorted. They're, They're like, no we're in the middle of the woods. No one will hear us. <laughs> the spy! <laughs> don't tell anyone! Shush! Mom's the word! And so they're saying, you don't have a choice because an order has come in from him. It's just like always, even if the message gets just intercepted, they'll just think it's other people talking and we're out here. No one's going to see us. Everything is leading up to Camino. You always pulled off just what all for one asked. Fail now and he'll kill us. You know that, Yuga. And it is Aoyama when in a two-page spread, just bawling, tears running down his face as he is being beseeched by his parents, who apparently have had an agreement with All for One ever since Aoyama was a kid. This is actually something that people have been theorizing for a long time as well, that Aoyama was not born with a quirk because he has such difficulties with it. So maybe his body was not actually proper, never meant to have it, basically. Yeah. And it turns out, yes, that's the case. Ayama, like Deku, was born quirkless, we find out in this explanation. And so in order to give their son a chance to pursue his dream of being a hero, they did what they had to in order to find a way to get him a quirk. And all for one offered him that chance. And they were forever indebted to him and basically had to do whatever he said. And they can't refuse him now because he will fucking kill them. So Ayama's the spy. <gasps> so, two things. Three things, really. One, I'm glad we're not getting that thing that you were worried about, Chris, which was the female opposition who then just gets killed and is gone and then we forget about them. That That's not apparently happening again. Two, Ayama is a more interesting choice than Karakure because, you know, he has character traits. Um, <laughs> and three, I am actually a little bit sad for Karakure that she's not getting uh, I, I will say that, yeah, in, in response to your first, yes, it is good that she is not going to be uh, probably just killed or whatever as female characters intend to do. Instead, she has zero role, <laughs> and her main uh, contribution was to tell a man how to get involved in this situation instead of her. Which, in all fairness, we have not finished this story. Next chapter, Hagakure might be a huge part of it. But, in the moment we're in right now, I would not be shocked if someone read this chapter and forgot Hagakure had any role in this chapter whatsoever because her actual involvement was like, oh, I overheard this. I guess I'll go tell Deku. Yeah, pretty much. And Deku will um, deal with it. It's, I, I get this feeling that years down the line when My Hero Academia is, I don't know, Vigilantes is on its last chapter or something like that, you know, then we will be able to look back and we'll go like on the My Hero uh, wiki or something like that. And it'll say under Hagakure's character info page, she has the quirk of invisibility and was part of class 1A. She witnessed Aoyama talking <laughs> with his parents and so she went to tell Deku. <laughs> and then it's just that's the end of the introduction part. <laughs> that's, that, it'll say, uh, whatever we want to call this arc, final war arc, it'll say, Hikakure overheard Aoyama was the traitor and told Deku, period. Epilogue. Hagakure became a model or something. <laughs> like some dumb, like, <laughs> what, what job could she have that would be super ill-fitting for her in the epilogue? She became... Uh makeup uh makeup model that yeah there you go like, yeah for foundation and everything yeah, yeah exactly something like that she became a foundation model uh person and uh people were just like huh well okay then <laughs> hand model there we go so to get back to actually talking about the chapter in terms of what it has given us in terms instead of what it has not. 
Look, it's important to consider both, but yes. let's, to get to the meat of it, Aoyama says that he's basically been playing a part this entire time. Uh, and he's, but he says, you know, when All for One was caught in Camino, for a moment I mistakenly let myself believe that just maybe I was free to have true friends and put an end to my acting. And this does give us a great deal of, oh, I didn't hadn't really considered that kind of uh, stuff with Aoyama, where he's always acting very, you know, goofy and over the top. Uh, but he has also had that uh, self-conscious, uh, uh, that from where he does realize like, oh, everyone else is so much better than me and stuff like that. It does add additional stuff to that of, oh, he's, you know, doesn't think that he's actually suited to stay alongside these people because, you know, there's a lot of literal imposter syndrome going yeah. on there. So it adds, it adds something to that. And, and I do appreciate that. So... His parents are sad, he's sad, but he realizes he doesn't have a choice in this moment because if he doesn't keep on doing what Off for One is making him do, then his parents are going to be killed. He, he's got to do it. Um, and however, at that moment, they hear some rustling in the bushes, and it turns out that Aoyama's parents uh, have, make weird expressions just like he does because his mom goes, <laughs> uh, and Deku sees them. Hagakure went and got him. You can tell because there are gloves floating there. Um, <laughs> actually, she shows up and um, he says, Hagakure just told me what she heard. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you know she was significant. If we hadn't... Now, I know Deku was already out there to find uh, Ayama. Uh, but think about like the what-if world. You know, Because what-if is a big thing right now. What if Hagakure had it been there to overhear Ayama's parents loudly speak about her, their son being a traitor. Now, presumably Deku just would have heard it like five minutes later, but <laughs> the, the consequences of it, the world would have shifted. Really loudly and flamboyantly over here. <laughs> it's the forest. No one would be talking, so I'll, I guess I'll go investigate that. Um, so, of course, Ayama sees Deku, and he's still crying, and he just goes, oh, Midoriya. And he thinks to himself, I was the only one who couldn't say a word to you. In that moment, only I was silent. And I think I made a comment about this at the time when we were talking about, like, oh, everyone gets a moment with Deku. And then there were one or two that didn't. Mm -hmm. I think that we may know that Ayama wasn't them. I can't remember whether or not that's the case. But hey, that's, that's it's, good. It's that touched upon, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, and as Deku you know, starts to say something, Aoyama is just, you know, thinks back to, you know, some of their time together. And Deku says, you've been looking so gloomily lately, and it's only been you. So I thought something must be wrong, so I came looking for you out here. So even before Hagakure went and got him, he was, in fact, looking for him, which... Again, to the point of, well, I guess Hagakure really didn't do anything. But I think that that is, you know, a nice sign of, like, Odeku really does care about his friend Ayama, uh, who is a really unimportant character up to this point. And that's really sweet. Uh -huh. And, you know, Aoyama just continues to reflect on how inadequate he is felt. But then he says, at the USJ, and then in the forest, each time I led them to us. I am a despicable villain, Midoriya. And we get a little flashback of the cheese message uh, from before. And oh no, it has deeper meaning now because of its because it yeah. said I know. He really did know back then. So, yeah. There's going to be some interesting stuff involving like, what's been going on with Diana to explore, I think. Um, so yeah. I, I will say this. I don't want to get. I don't want to jump the gun or anything like that because I think next week or whenever we actually deal with the ramifications of this, we could get more and it'll be better. I will agree that I think Aoyama getting a little character development is going to be good. Uh, it is uh, kind of bitterly amusing that it was like my son is quirkless. Oh, I gave him a quirk. What'd you give him? Oh, he shoots lasers from his belly button and then it makes him shit himself afterwards. <laughs> like, oh, thank you for the wonderful quirk. 
I, I'm so sorry to make you part with it. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, you could. Yes. It's a great, a great <laughs> loss, but I'm sure you will prove yourselves worthy of He's it. He's like, yeah, you owe me greatly. <laughs> oh um, God, I don't have this <laughs> stupid laser button bullshit. Um, however, to the to the red herring twist of it all, of, oh, it's a Gakure. Oh, wait, no, it's Ayama. Um, it exists exclusively for the people who read this week to week. I can only imagine if there are people out there who only read this volume, like in the volume format, that it's just going to be like confusing and stupid. Like, you're just like, why was Hagakure shown at the last panel? She barely is involved in the next chapter. Like, it's just going to be such a yeah. weird thing. And this is not exclusively a Horikoshi thing. One Piece did this very recently with the Odin, like, Odin's alive reveal. It's like, no, he's fucking not. Like, <laughs> Odin's alive! No, he's not! <laughs> so, like, it's, I don't want to act like it's specifically Horikoshi or anything like that, but I, I will say that I was like, it is one of those moments I'm like, uh, it feels like it existed only to frustrate fans. Like, I feel like at some point Horikoshi had heard there was a lot of growing suspicion that Hagakure was the traitor and wanted to play into it and then be like, got that fucking rug from underneath you bitches! It's Ayama! And I'm like, I don't know, that just kind of sucks. I don't know. For storytelling purposes, in terms of what has been established, in terms of character dynamics and everything else, Ayama is definitively a better choice than Hagakure because of the Although he has not been a constant presence, he has shown up enough times to make you think about him, and he has a pre-existing relationship with Deku. Mm -hmm. So, he's a, he's a better choice. But yes, you're completely right about the way it was executed. It was just to get that, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I bet you guys thought you were real smart. The Hagakure, because they just asked you, what if the Hagakure moment is at the end of the volume? That's still going to be... Like, the point of the matter is it only... I mean, I guess you get it if you're, like, reading it volume to volume, not actively. Like, you're you're waiting, or you're reading it volume to volume as it comes out. But even then, it's still going to be, fr like, it's frustrating to us as readers reading it week to week. Because you were like, oh, it's nothing. I imagine it'll be even more frustrating if you're reading it month to month or, or, or two months or however long the, the gap is between volumes coming out. You're just like, so what the fuck? It wasn't the Gakure at all. <laughs> and then she disappeared. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's speed up. That we got Undead Unlocked Chapter Ninety to talk about. Number ninety, you negating lugs, which is what uh, Andy said last week, and Andy repeats it this week. So they have yes. a plan. They're going to use their powers against Spring through the avenue of instead going after Andy. Uh, so Tatiana is asked to give robes out to everybody. I guess she just has robes hanging out inside her orb pockets because uh, she shoots out a bunch of uh, robes to everybody. Uh, there's also a joke about her asking where uh, tops are, and he says, I tossed it when I transformed. So he'll have to share a robe with Ashin, who is very nervous to do so. She looks very shy. I feel bad for her. Um, yeah. They're like, hey, we're going to go do this. Uh, Rip kind of wants an explanation about all this, and I, I do like it because Nico pops in to be like, oh, these uh, robes are to block the cherry tree transformation. He's like, I don't, I'm not fucking talking about that. I'm talking about what's this stupid plan you're doing, because I don't really want to. Like, they, they show off, basically, an explanation of Andy attacking uh, Spring, and nothing happening, and turning into a tree, and then cutting it off, but if he uses, like, one of his attacks against himself, and the after uh, effect goes off, it, you know, it works. So, as long as you're attacking Spring indirectly, it could work, and they're going to send Fuku into the core. And then uh, Rip comes up and says, there is another way to breed Spring, and he attacks Andy. And he says, if we kill Fuku, the game ends, Spring will lose its protection, and we can just go back to attacking. And not only that, but we take out a huge number of Yuja's forces, and we have, like, an easy way to steal the loop device arc. This is the best path forward. And Andy's like, Awesome! You're doing it real well! You're attacking me super hard! This is gonna work! Come on, come at me with everything you got! No, I actually want to kill Fuku! Yeah, no, I'm trying to kill you! Yeah, yeah, that's right! Get the character! <laughs> uh, there's a brief moment where they go off having their fight, and Juez and Billy are left behind, and uh, Juez is just like, undead and unlock. Looking at those two makes me think that they'll be, fine. they'll be able to make a real difference for us, and I stand by that belief. So... A little bit more stuff there. Uh, the fight starts going on. We have... Uh, oh, God, I forgot his name. 
Shen? No. Who's untruth? Not untruth anymore because now he's uh, a zombie. Oh. Was it I Shen? Think, I think it is Shen. I think it is. It's Shen. Shen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Shen attacks with his, his big or uh, big war, big rod. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, and Spring just gives like a big line about like, playtime is over, negators. That do like 80s be like, oh, you dropped the whole haiku speech pattern thing. I was really liking that. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Too big to make rhyme structures. <laughs> uh, Andy's about to get attacked by a whole bunch of vines, and then one misses him. And it's because Andy is busy floating in midair, and it's Shakar using unmove, and he says, this is just me stopping Mr. Andy. Nothing but Mr. Andy. And it's like, aw, he's getting even better at focusing. Uh, Andy does his little skin ripping off technique, <laughs> which is yep. very unnerving. And uh, Juez shouts, rip, shoot Andy with one of your blades. He's like, fuck you. I'm not going to do anything you say. And she uses unjustice to make her do it. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's the funniest one in the chapter for me. <laughs> He's like, no, I don't want to do it. All right, I'll use unjustice. God damn it. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> uh, Top starts running towards uh, everybody. Uh, to starts running towards Andy with a shin on her back, his back. And uh, shit is in her unbreakable armor. And he says, hey, you know, just watch. Unbreakable and unstoppable on the way. I'm going to prove that your armor is something incredible. Uh, and basically comes in. I thought he would run at full speed and then swing the armor into Andy. Because basically it slams straight into spring afterwards. Uh, instead he kicks. And now I don't know how the physics of this works. <laughs> so... In my mind, I was like, oh, he's going to use his speed to kick. It doesn't matter. He did a rider kick. That's yeah. all that matters. Yeah, that is true. He got the rider kick in. Uh, but that's uh, the end of the chapter as uh, Andy just shouts, hey, spring, playtime's just getting started. Yeah, fun action chapter. Little little fun jokes here and there that are, that are nice. It was a fun, uh, quick read. Yes. So, good stuff. Let's talk about Kaiju number eight, chapter 51. Isao is determined to take out Kaiju number nine so that it never exists in my daughter's future. Yay. Um, he is unleashing an, a directed energy attack, which is apparently the thing that Kaiju number two used to fucking destroy Sapporo in the past. Uh, but they say, oh no, your body won't be able to keep up, Isao. But hey, he's exposed the core of Kaiju number nine. But Kaiju number nine says... But you see, I've prepared myself to endure this by evolving. And it starts to change shape as the attack hits him. It's focusing its entire body on defense. Uh, but Isao just um, punches him again. Uh, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> and um, it blows up the everything. Uh, there's a giant blast of light that shoots out of the bunker and through a two buildings beyond that. Yeah. Nope, no one was in those buildings. Um. It is an extremely satisfying sequence of panels of the giant laser ripping through a building. It's slowly, like, disintegrating, and then the building's just crumbling to pieces in the aftershock, basically. Yeah. It's a huge shockwave that gets sent out everywhere from the sheer force of the blow. Uh, Kafka and Narumi are both still on their way. The scientist guy was the, is still there, and he was even though he was a ground zero, he's fine, I guess. <laughs> uh, Kaiju number nine, not looking so good, but he's still standing, and he says, "Not even my power to body could fully withstand it." And the body starts to completely deteriorate and collapse away. And the scientist guy's like, "He did it!" Uh, no. Kaiju number two, nine is still alive. The core is still intact, and the body is still kind of sort of there. It's there, there. It's like the withered remains of Kaiju number nine are still there, but the core is still intact. And it just says, "Too bad, though. This is the human limit. If you had a kaiju body, I would have lost." The scientist warns Isao that he needs to get away, but Isao just says, "What attack? Just one more attack." And then. I don't know what happens because Kaiju number nine goes, come number two. And he starts to swell and body parts start sprouting out everywhere. They start to surround Isao and he says, come back to the Kaiju side. And he's surrounding him with like teeth and arms and stuff. And we cut outside and there's smoky ruins 
and we see Kafka and Narumi coming, and Narumi is wondering what's going on, and then they look, and they see Sao kind of hunched over on top of the giant Kaiju number no. nine body that there was before. So, I believe we're not meant to know exactly what has happened yet because of, you know, yes. number nine's ability to assume people's forms. So, is this the really Sal? Has Kaiju number nine absorbed him and just taken on his appearance? What's happened? But it was kind of weird to have that note of, like, come back to the Kaiju side! And then you cut over and then you see him and you, you just kind of like, what, what happened? So, it was a little bit weird reading this for me. I, I feel like what we're going to get is he, he got taken over um, for multiple reasons. One, because the two main characters didn't really have too crazy of a fight and now they just have both shown up to the scene so i feel like oh hey they're gonna fight a kaiju version of a sow is like a pretty good way to give a climax to this arc um and also just it feels like this was an inevitable like real confrontation that would have to happen but it is definitely something where you're supposed to sit here and be like did he get taken over what's happening um I'm still at that point with Kaiju number eight, though, where I'm just like, I'm not super vibing with it. Mm. I think maybe the next chapter might be where it starts coming together. But right now I'm still at a place where I'm just like, eh. Yeah, I got you. Let's talk about both chapters. <sighs> World Trigger. Let's, let's just go through this quite quickly. Because, so, I just want to say this straight up. We've kind of been saying for a while, because like the, the entire year now, officially, of World Trigger has been... Everything surrounding this away mission test, mm. whether it be the selection of teams or the actual first portion. First portion. <laughs> I want to stress this. There's another portion after this week of which we've seen like two days is over or whatever it is supposed to be. I'm okay with just seeing written tests and deciding who's cooking and who's sleeping <laughs> where. This video game sucks. <laughs> I, <just laughs> <wanted to see laughs> I, I had a moment where I think like, because it was after last week, we had all the rules explained and they started the chapters. And I was like, you know what? I suddenly get why Tagashi explained all of the rules of the auction and then never showed us it because this sucks ass and this is boring to read. Like, I there's very little actual character development happening. In the course of all this, we get a little bit from the one dude from the one squad who apparently finds himself so confident that he will exclude yeah, the rest of his team to do it. There's yeah. that. And then there's also the notion that, like, oh, Osamu is a good captain because he's picked up on these tactics faster than the other members of the, his group that hasn't. Like, cool. And he's doing it without super powerful units. Uh, we haven't actually gotten to see him turn about and everything. Like, they, they ate shit this entire time. But I, I will note, like... This was definitely two chapters of World Trigger that were more obnoxious to read than anything else. I think that the only things that stand out to me are just the moments where Katori is saying hacks, basically. And that's, yeah. and that's about it. Katori's <laughs> just super fucking salty. Like, I do appreciate that. It is fully in character with, you know, she's been established that this, you know, like, she kind of relates everything to gaming and she's like this is such broken bullshit and she just doesn't care and they're like they have to keep reiterating to her it's not meant to be a balanced game she's like I don't fucking care it's bullshit <laughs> send it back to dev yeah like it is definitely a thing where you're like hey, at some point what the fuck why am I spending time with this though because this is like a weird way of like it's enough of a game that it doesn't feel like an accurate way to portray real battles in any kind of meaningful yeah. way so like uh, maybe there should be some kind of game design element to it, but um, she is also just a very salty person, me. So it, it yeah. might be better design than that. The two chapters, rather, the second chapter ends with them getting a new assignment in the midst of them having to handle like they're they're only like halfway through the first day of these simulated battles, and they've got to now work on this assignment in between doing that one. So they've got to multitask. And their question is, why did the matches of the B-Rank Wars pit three or four squads against each other instead of just two? Think over the possible reasons, compile your opinions, and submit your response in under 400 words by this time. So they've got to answer this question. And for every reason, uh, Sue thinks to himself, 
you got to be kidding me, really doing us dirty here, which I guess is just because he's upset about the fact that they've got to, you know, do it's, both of these It's things. a lot, yeah. They, they have to handle the current task they're on while also answering this question, and they're a team that is also in last place and has just gotten a complete sweep against them in all this, so it's a very, it's a daunting thing to have on top of that. Yeah. Okay, that, that's World Trigger. I, yeah. It's, <laughs> I've uh, reached my breaking point finally on, on this whole thing. Take out the video game, please. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're going to have to deal with the video game for a little bit longer, yeah. which is very frustrating. Uh, but yeah, I, like I had fun during the draft being like, oh, it's so funny. We spent an entire chapter on one round. But then I reached a point here where I was just like, yeah, let's fucking move on. <laughs> let's get going. Oh. <laughs> I ain't living forever. At least there were fun moments during the draft where, like, you know, user was like, put me in the same team as Chica and just, like, other stuff like that. But then yeah, this... Yeah, the fact there's, 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 there's no character moments. Nothing fun. Yeah, there's... Nothing fun going. There's nothing to really latch on to. Uh, let's talk about Eden Zero, Nick. Chapter... No fun. <laughs> chapter 171, Wander in Space. So, we start in one of Rebecca's streams. We get to see how she is as a B-tuber, which I don't... I mean, I get no, it's called BTuber, but I guess she's more of a Twitch streamer actually, because this is definitely live stream, this yes. is definitely like a, a live stream uh, parody. And she's like, "Oh, hey, I'm getting a comment from somebody. It's in a different language. Let's translate it. It's somebody who wants Rebecca's panties." And they make a bunch of jokes about that. And afterwards, uh, we are shown. And then they just sign off on that. Note, yeah, they. By the way. Yeah. Horrible. <laughs> It's a horrible way to end the stream. Never do that. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are shown Couch Po, who did not change it or design whatsoever. Uh, and we find out that Couch Po has... Sure now. Yeah. She has 2 million more subscribers than Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca has 3 million. And I like that they're, again, ultra, ultra popular B Cooper. Three million subscribers on a galactic scale. <laughs> it's exactly the 1,000 people uh, situation all over again. Most subscribed YouTube channels. Um, let's get past the Nazi. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the... All right. So, uh, okay. Ed Sheeran. Uh, you know, that there's what? very basic. All right. but, well, he's up there. He's like 28. He's got 48.9 million on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you're in the top 2,000 B-Cubers, you should have billions of viewers. <laughs> I do love it. It's the idea that she's considered ultra popular. <laughs> and her numbers are kind of low, even for Earth. <laughs> like, huh. <laughs> How many people died in that battle? Oh, over a thousand. <laughs> like a th Hold on. Think of the scale. It's had to be like 200, three, no, a thousand. Let's go crazy. We're at the galactic scale. How many people this subscribe is... to Rebecca? 40,000. No, a million. Hell, three million. This is, it's like, it's like that one scene in like Austin Powers where like Dr. Evil doesn't know how much money to ask for. Like he doesn't, he has yeah. no, just no sense of scale. Like, <laughs> It's actually not that much. <laughs> uh, so Sister's Butt comes in and says, Seriously, you really were trash as a B-Cuber, and now look how popular you are. You really made yourself into something. Uh, so we're introduced to Sister, whose breasts have gotten bigger in a way that I can't comprehend for robots. <laughs> oh, there's... I, I was going... To... I can't comment on this yet. Just how pervy this chapter is because I know what happens in a couple pages. Uh, Moscow is there. He is called the caretaker. And uh, he just says uh, a beating from sister's tongue should be considered a reward. Moscow. So he is uh, also quite the same. We're introduced to Elsie who has also not changed. And she's like, oh, well, cool. You can't, see, you can't see her breasts. Yeah. In the shots <laughs> her breasts <laughs> may have gotten a lot bigger since the time scale. That's really what's changed his character. And I say this fully knowing 
Car- like the two female straw hats breasts getting bigger was literally part of their time skip design. <laughs> so it's it's a real thing. It's it's a real challenge. I I, I pine for the days of uh, of bleach where the time skip meant everyone just got a much more distinct Isn't haircut. <laughs> like everyone just everyone defined themselves in two years by getting a different haircut. <laughs> Uh, hey, Luke Charger did that. Yeah, <laughs> look. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, so we 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 do need to note. Uh, Elsie is talking to Shiki about like, oh hey, let me know when you find Ziggy. Also, my home used to be around here, so hey, maybe we'll we'll deal with that at some point. Jin pops in, whose hair has gotten longer. He uh, outside of Shiki is the person whose character design has changed the most so far, and he says it's been three years. And then we meet Laguna, who actually looks significantly different. Um, I don't know if I would say better, he but he does look different. Gaunt, in a way. Yes. He looks, I guess, very regal, so there is that. Uh, so they're like, hey, what are we doing? Why are we, like, how long are we basically going to keep doing this? And the answer is, until we get a lead about Ziggy. Right now, we don't know, so we're just going to have to keep doing it. There's we- a weird exchange that happens here. Okay. Where Weiss and Hermit like finished the same thought because Weiss says the fact that he won't even leave us a clue, and Hermit says is what makes him Ziggy. Which is it? I I guess he's I guess because he's so skilled is why he's Ziggy. You know, he's 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 better than all these other dear tier villains who just leave clues behind everywhere. I don't know, look, can we just, like, stay on this one panel and talk about it for, like, the next 20 minutes and just not talk about the rest <laughs> I, of it? I, I don't want to stay on that panel in particular because it continues to add support to the idea that there's going to be a Weiss Hermit ship, and I don't want that to be... I don't want to project that into reality anywhere. I, I want to make what sure if, that never happens. What if the sexual tension between Weiss and Laguna just suddenly snaps and they just start making out instead? I'd then... be much more excited yeah. about that. I'd be yeah. much more excited if we got that as opposed to the Loli robot. <laughs> so oh, we could call the ship name Whitewater. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we do have to actually get to it. So there's a big bath scene. That's how we get introduced to Clean. She's uh, washing hey, her boobs. Her boobs got bigger too. Her <laughs> boobs got bigger. And all the ladies are here. Hermora, Rebecca, Sister... Weird couch pose not here. I yeah, wonder it what it is about couch po yeah. that would lead her to being discluded from this scene. I mean, there's a robot in here bathing, so clearly all of the characters could be here, but she is suspiciously absent. Weird. Um, I, I, I like this scene has so little. It is uh three or four characters talking about how like oh the government's coming after us and all these things and it's basically like four characters just talking about how cool Shiki is and it's it's a weird moment to fail the Bechtel test and it's four characters <laughs> talking about things but somehow the conversation just ropes back to Shiki being super cool and Rebecca keeps on posing for something yeah I don't know why I can't imagine any reason why she keeps on striking the poses that she does, but she does. Oh, her her back is in agony right now. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So. They do mention a massage later, so. Yeah, there you go. Maybe that's the case. Uh, Shiki goes over to Witch's throne, I guess, and sits on it. (laughs) It's the throne. So this is where he received command of the Eden Zero. Yeah. So. Apparently, it's kind of treated almost as like an altar for yeah. for witch. So, so yeah, he he's gotten the control, and he he looks upon it, and he says, "Witch, you two, Valkyrie, I'll protect the ship. The ship, I am its sword and its shield. I'll beat Ziggy, and I'll take us to mother. You see." And he gets a little communicator thing that's like, "Shiki, it's Hermit. We found a castaway. What should we do?" And they're like, "It's just a human." And Rebecca pops up because she's hearing this communication. She's like, "Wait a minute, I think I felt this before." And she runs out without changing. Um, also, sister said, "Hey, you promised you'd let me give you my mind-numbing torture, a ple- torture and pleasure massage after your bath today." So, there's that little yeah. bit. Uh, yeah. 
and we see the uh the castaway and it's Captain Connor bum 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 and Rebecca shows up and me is like time up he's 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 not a good person he's he's the the captain of the Eden's one and he's like oh no I'm no I'm not <laughs> <laughs> and he's it's like, yeah, no, I know you work for Ziggy. I'm from the other universe. I know what happened. And he's like, yeah, I know. I, I did. I worked at his droid factory until recently I learned it belonged to Ziggy. And as soon as I found out they were making cruel and vicious robots, I got myself out of there. And that's when I went adrift. And then Shiki smiles and is like, droid factory, we found it. The road that'll take us to Ziggy. He looks bizarrely sinister in that shot. Yeah. Uh, we're now two chapters into Syria Ziggy, or to Syria Shiki, sorry. And how do you feel about him currently? I mean, Shiki is probably the best part of this time skip, honestly. Yeah. Like, all right. between, between all of the other characters that haven't changed at all or have changed <laughs> in ways that are disappointing, um, yeah. I would like to see more glimpses of stuff, like, in terms of, like, hey... How has time aboard the Inzero zero for three years actually changed Queen's personality? You know, that would be kind of something that would be nice to see. Or Laguna's, you know. Uh, but uh, we have no, not had any time spent on any of that because more important things have happened. Because it's very important to stay hygienic. So go take a bath right now. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Oh, God. <laughs> I accidentally had the world trigger chapters on either side. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I don't want to talk. We're going to talk about Doran Dororan. I think that I actually said too many. Oh, well. You Doran Dororan. Okay. So, chapter two Stray Leak Samurai. Last time. Do, 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 main character and uh, Kusanagi met each other. Uh,. Kusanagi reflects on how he's been trying to protect people from other Mononoke by himself this whole time, thinking that he had to do it by himself because nobody would trust him. But now he and uh, Do 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 Do, 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 Do uh, are trying to figure out a way that he can, you know, be around him inconspicuously. He can change his shape, so hey, maybe he could be like a pet or a bag or a hat. None of that's really working out correctly, though. Um, and uh, then. Out of nowhere, Do says, you know, you're not scary, Kusanagi. Why don't you just go as you are? And Kusanagi says, I can't do that. Mononoke have hurt people. Everyone hates and fears us. And if people see you hanging out with Mononoke, they'll target you too. Dora. Dora! Dora, Dora, Dora. The, the Explorer! Oh, no, no. Dora! Boots and super cool Explorer Dora. Dora! I had to watch a lot of it as a kid for my little sister. Okay. I was trying to think of a thing that could play off of an okay, but oh well. I think that you just like recited well, the, the actual the, scene. There, there was Boots the Monkey. And also the map. On 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 the map. That was literally just like all he could say. Yeah, and it's like, okay, map. We're going to go to the caves. I'm the map. <laughs> ah, map! <laughs> Just screamed it. Uh, my favorite was the book bag, though. Who at the end of his uh, little song would go, "Nom nom 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 nom, delicioso." I'm like, did, "You motherfucker, did you just eat my magnifying glass? I need that, you piece of shit!" And just start strangling the backpack. <laughs> you didn't just eat my lunch, did you? So anyway. <laughs> Also, it would apparently eat things through its scalp because its mouth was on like the lower part of it. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's it's actually a predator. That first mouth is actually a false mouth to trick uh, its prey. <laughs> the top is where it actually feeds upon you from. And if you actually look inside, there's just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's eldritch. It's like it's like going on acid trip or something like that. You just look inside. You're like, what's happening? You see scales. Or is like creatures of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say darkness? <laughs> the Eldritch gods are me amigos. <laughs> Do you eat friends? <laughs> Do you see Cthulhu? And the little cursor's like it's scared to go up and click on. It. Like no, <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> that's a tree. Click on Cthulhu, your master. <laughs> click on Cthulhu, your master. <laughs> In Espanol! <laughs> Clicking on Sulu's face, Throck! 
You're like, Bob, Dad, I think we had to turn this off. I don't think she should be watching this anymore. <laughs> Is this like a special or something? <laughs> Dad, the TV's leaking. Oh, that's fine. You're just looking. You're just now being able to see four dimensional shapes where the true gods dwell. <laughs> Spend some time with your goddamn sister. <laughs> like, uh, uh. Anyway, well, Dora, not the Explorer, and Mon and uh, Kusanagi are having a conversation. Uh, Kusanagi is really upset about Dora getting in trouble, and hey, two samurai show up. And now it just occurs to me how stupid the samurai uniform actually is. It, they look like they're just wearing awfully designed baseball uniforms or whatever. Is. Yeah, they're not great. <laughs> so, anyway, Dora has to hide the fact he was talking to, to a moment. Okay, they hustle off. Kusanagi looks like a hat now. Hey, looks like somebody's drowning. Uh, oh, right, because Kusanagi actually hid in the water. Oh, it's the, uh, a Mononoke attack happens. The samurai are trying to deal with it, uh, but when one of them tries to attack it, his sword just snaps on the thing's head. So... Uh, Dora turns Kusanagi into a sorpier. It's hard to tell what it is. Anyway, he throws a blade and it hits the thing, and the guy's like, "Ah, you're no match for my armor." And Kusanagi just goes, "I can't let Dora down." And uh, it turns out he is a match for that armor because the uh, Monoke um, explodes into two pieces, and um, uh, it, 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 it's it's fire now. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's gone. Yes. One of the two samurai is still conscious. Kusanagi goes to check on him really quick. He's just like, hey, are you okay? Um, the uh, samurai uh, starts to get up, but Kusanagi just says, hey, don't worry about me. Worry about your friend. You've got to get him to your to a hospital. Uh, and so uh, there's some hesitation. Dora grabs Kusanagi and runs off. And the samurai just says, wait, thank you. You saved us, both of you. Thank you. Uh and, uh, but Kusanagi's just like, hey, just get him to the hospital. And Dora then says, this Mononoke is a good guy, right? Okay, so, uh, the, Dora's like, hey, it's only a matter of time. People are going to start to like you, Kusanagi, so you won't have to disguise yourself forever. One day everyone will accept you. And Kusanagi's like, well, how? And Dora's like, you said, you heard what I said, remember? And Kusanagi's like, oh, that I'm a good guy? Yeah. So, anyway... Then they're like, all right, miracles, we'll make it happen. Uh, we've been alone on this for a while, but we're together now. We're, we're, we're Ibos. Um, and then Dora looks around and he's like, we're amateurs. We're mavericks. We're renegades. And then he looks around and he spots, oh, hey, there's that cat that stole the food earlier and she's had her litter. And they're riding around on her back. And then he thinks about when he pulled out a leak and told his mom he's going to be a samurai. And so in a true Kaiser Sose moment, he just goes, stray leak samurai. That's what we are. Okay. So maybe it's a pun. In I was Japanese. going to say, it, it must sound a lot better in Japanese. <laughs> and it just did not translate. <laughs> uh, Dora gets home and uh, he, Kusanagi looks like a pair of headphones that's his disguise, it looks actually kind of cool and uh, they're like, yeah, we're gonna patrol the town as stray leak samurai but oh, someone has spotted them it's the female samurai who was in the first chapter and is on the cover pages and stuff apparently, she has been talking to people she talked to those kids that they saved she talked to the samurai they saved and she spotted them in this moment now and she says, ah, it's them, all right. And uh, that's where we end chapter two. So, You know my favorite part of this chapter was? No, I do not. Uh, the part where we talked about Dora the Explorer and the Cthulhu elements. That was really, <laughs> really the best part of it. And uh, damn, I was debating between that joke or doing the Statler and Waldorf. The part where it ended! Oh! <laughs> I don't know which one would be better now that I think about it. Uh-uh. Um, it was functional. I'll give it that much. It's fine. But I've said that for the last chapter. And if the series, yeah. all it has going for it is being fine, then it, 
you know, that's it. And yeah, we're not going to remember this in six months, basically. Yeah, that's that's, <laughs> that's a bit of a bummer. But what are you gonna do? Now let's talk about Maguchan, God of Destruction. Starting. Hey, guess what else had a popularity poll, everybody? <laughs> yeah. Guess what? The right person won. <laughs> yeah, baby. Our boy Naputraku. My He's son. The king is crowned. <laughs> Look at him. Everyone loves him. The hermit crabs love him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Magu's probably furious, but the person who deserved the crown the most got it. Yeah, I like how everyone's doing Super Smash Brothers clapping in the background, which you just know, given the fact that we have seen how much Kei Kamiki likes Super Smash Brothers. Yeah. It's probably deliberate. <laughs> um, some other noteworthy bits. Uh, BS is, was in seventh place. Uh, the Hermit Crabs were in fifth place. And um, although Zonzige got in there, Gula did not. No. Gula... Like, Gula was one of the lower ranked ones. No Shukushu wasn't technically a part of it. You had to write her in because she came out after the poll had started. Uh, so that's why maybe she didn't make it. Although I'd imagine she would have also been one of the least popular one of the Chaos Gods. Muscar barely stuck in there too. Uneris is up in fourth place. So I guess that explains why she's in so much of the series. So I Look. People were like, Chris is going to be angry that Uneris got fourth. I don't give a shit what Uneris got. Fucking Naputaku was first. He was number one, baby. I don't give a flying fuck about anyone after first place at that point. I, yeah. Whatever. She could be fourth. You want to know what she's not? First. Because Naputaku is first. Eat shit. Die angry. <laughs> By a pretty wide margin, too. It was uh, 19,000 votes to just under 15,000 for uh, Magu. Yes. And uh, then Ruru all the way back at around 6,000 votes. So Magu got a lot, but Naputugu very easily won. Yes. So, now, it, it is also worth He's noting the, the popularity poll came out at exactly the chapter where we got the frenzied roar moment from Naputugu. <laughs> but here's, well, here's the it. thing. It's because Naputugu's great. It, here's the thing. I don't think we're going to last long enough to see a character popularity poll, too. So, as far as I'm concerned, Naputaku is and forever will be the most <laughs> popular character in Magushin. Uh, hey, Uneris has revealed that she is behind the plot to have abducted Ruru and stuff. She's stirring up shit, and she's saying that she's going to protect her adorable holy knights. And, like, her real form is, like, reaching up through a portal beneath her regular form. Um... She summons a bunch of more flaxuses of herself. They summon beams of energy to shoot stuff. And so everyone's kind of have to having to deal with them. Uh, Ren starts swinging a baseball bat at them. And one of them swipes the Putaku's chicken. And that's the only thing he cares about. One of them took his fried chicken. <laughs> so he tries to use his power of madness to have them turn against each other. And they all put on magical noise-canceling headphones. So it doesn't work. <laughs> Poor Naputaku. <laughs> Aw, my boy. Um, Magu says to to, to Naputsuku and Ren that they're just going to get in his way and to go and retrieve Ruru while I settle things with Uneris. Um, but Ren tells him, hey, don't overdo it. We've got to all go together with Ruru. So, uh, he rushes off. Um, the knights try and abduct them, but, um, Ren says, Vegetable oil attack! And Naputsuku pours, pours a bunch of vegetable oil on the ground behind them to stop their pursuit. The, the ten generals of the Holy Knights <laughs> foiled by a slippery staircase. Uh, there are some cool action shots as Magu starts fighting the Morphalactic Uneruses, and he's like casting his beam around in an arc. It looks cool. Uh, Izuma is still there because, you know, he's got actual combat skills so he can, you know, not get in the way. Oneris does her, does a fortification thing, so she's got like black bits in her hair now. Okay. Um, and Oneris says to Izuma and and Magu, you really have no faith in me. That's what got us into this myth in the first place, though. I'll have to take responsibility for it. The Holy Knighthood has made you a target to be taken out, so I'll use the power of my true form to do so. And Izuma is conflicted. What should he do? Because he knows that taking out the, the gods is the mission of the knights, but he's not sure. And he thinks back to when he was a little kid, and he and Seira were training to be Holy Knights and trying to use magic and stuff. And Uneris, um told some lies 
Can you believe it? <gasps> what? She told this whole thing about how there was a that like humans can't actually use magic, but there was a human who didn't give up. You, the first Holenite was your ancestor, and he made a ta he made me craft a taboo magical item for him. Its name is Providential Blood. You have born you were born and in having inherited that blood in your veins. In other words, I am your mother. And Izma goes, that's impossible! And he has a lightsaber that lights up, because I was wondering briefly, is this actually a Star Wars reference? No, it is absolutely 100 billion percent. It is a Star Wars reference. Uh, and it's like, oh my god, he's using magical powers to make the sword go off. It turns out it's actually a glow stick. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, Veneris is like, yeah, I was just lying to you because I needed to shock you into, you know, actually triggering your latent magical abilities and you could do it. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can get stronger and stuff. And Yuzuma says, okay, I'm going to keep getting stronger and then I'll wipe out all of you wicked gods. Magu's not doing so well in the present because he doesn't have people giving him food to reju rejuvenate him. Uneris breaks out a huge-ass sealing gem to seal Magu away, and she says, Sorry, Ru, I'm going to put Magu-chan to sleep for thousands of years. But Magu says defiantly, even though he's crumpled on the ground, I will get my disciple back. I will make her prostrate before me, wake her each morning, gaze at the setting sun with her. And procure victuals. I will destroy Rumianagi's sorrows. I cannot afford to lose any more flesh and blood. I will get rid of you and that gem all in one go. Return to darkness. And he fires a huge ass black beam of destruction, the kind that has the power to destroy gods. Soon, Eris summons the Nitsi and summons a portal and redirects it to Magu. That bitch! <laughs> it is actually a magic cylinder! <laughs> it is a pretty cool uh, counter. Uh, so, yeah, that sucks. Magu's gonna kill himself. Or is he? Izuma uses the weapon that's been crafted for by Aeneris. It's a cool ass katana. He cuts the entire beam in half and stops it. His eyes have cross patterns in them. And he says, I know what I must do. I will not follow any more orders. It is true that Magnook is an abominable god who brings about destruction, but his soul is that of a noble knight who protects a young maiden's peace. Uneris, I will fulfill my promise from back then. I will defeat you. And he's all cool looking in his, 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 his he's got like black bits in his hair and it's flowing around him and he's enchanting his weapon. And Eris says, you really are so much like that man. So, hey, it's a big battle climax chapter that's coming up. It is bizarre. Yeah. It is bizarre how good battle chapters of Magu are. <laughs> it, was, it, was a good, it was a good battle chapter this time. All, All right, right, let's talk about every, everybody's favorite series. <laughs> protect me, Shugamaru. Shugamaru tries to protect oh, the oh, Hime girl. <laughs> I thought you were going to say. Goes wrong. <laughs> ah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I'm looking at this chapter in the moment right now, and I don't know if I actually forgot to read it, or if I did read it and it's just blended together with everything else. Uh, he makes a robot with scythe hands. Yeah. And then that's the joke of the chapter. Like, the robot goes nuts or something like that. And Not helps... In the previous chapters? He helps defeat the new guy who's just kind of like a horn dog. Who basically comes as close as being like, I would like to fuck you <laughs> to this girl <laughs> as you could get in like a comedy jump chapter. And it's really unnerving. He says, I don't care that you said no at one point. And I was like, oh, I hate you. <laughs> and I kind of wanted him to die at that point. I mean, I guess that the point of each chapter is that, you know, Eventually, there's got to be someone that Shugamaru, you know, deserves to fucking obliterate. Um, but this guy seems like he might be a recurring character, so... Oh, dear. He, he might hang around for a little bit. Anyway... I, I, I don't want to make... All that. <laughs> I don't want to make a huge deal out of a, a one-off line, but it is one of those things of just, like... It is definitely a weird line to have a character who says, I don't care that no means no, and you're like... That's 
a weird trait for somebody who you're not going to specifically say is a bad guy who should be uh, refuted and rebuked at every possible chance. Yeah, let's move on. Oh, wait, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Nick, it's, to come on. <laughs> it's three chapters. We got to decide if we're keeping it in the magazine. I mean, you can say that we are. I'm not going to read it, though. <laughs> well, what if at any point in time we have this just hanging about Nick? You want to keep it in a recap? Do you really want to do that to yourself? I have to read it on monthly other recap anyway. Hmm. I don't know if there's anything I can say to you to make you not use that in this moment. Well, here's 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 because, a... because I care so little about this series. <laughs> here's the thing. Whole. I am optimist. I'm not going to use this. I do not want to keep, cover this series in the recap, but I do not want to use the veto on it because I do not think this is going to be an actually fun series to discuss. Um. To that regard, maybe. I have been surprised by jump comedies I have not thought were amusing before. Maybe this series turns about. But I have very low expectations. You have not been given further reason to trust it will happen. Yes. Right. Let's move on. Dr. Stone! Time to get stoned! It's the equals 221, entrusting it all. Last time, Ryusu, we very, very clearly made up his mind to give up the position of the pilot on the mission to the moon to Stanley, because he realizes the most capable person for the job is not him, it's Stan. But we don't see this happen yet. Uh, he instead goes back to his home, and he looks at the model of the spaceship that they've built and how, you know... He, it, he's always been about like I, you know, I wanted to go off and sail on a, on a real proper vessel and everything. Senku passes by his window and he says through the closed window. So presumably he's like, I don't know. It depends on, the, on how soundproof the windows are. But he basically proposes this idea of like, hey, let's say that you know you're on this adventure to save a knight, but it turns out uh, save a princess rather, but it turns out there's a more capable knight that could save her. Do you step aside in order to have the better person do it, even though you really want to save the princess? What's your move as a science bro? And Senku is if for a moment just like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> but then he sees that he's staring at the ship, and Senku immediately reaches the same conclusion that Ryusui has reached some time ago which is yeah being a master of science is being a master of efficiency if there is someone who's better than me for the job of course i'm going to hand over the reins but re it, but of course they're both kind of like i mean you kind of already knew what, what you were going to do before this but say hey, sometimes people need to be told they're making the right decision so Zeno is surprised when they give him the news the next day, but he kind of like turns around and be like, I'm not surprised. But he's like, ah, yes, truly wise pick. No objections, I presume. Um, but uh, he admits that he is surprised by this. And he's like, hey, if you revive Stan, you might help me take over the world. And Ryusu and Seiko are like, yeah, we've kind of progressed science to the point where you like, you won't do that, though, because it, it won't give you an edge anymore. So, Zeno says, all right, well, tell everyone that I threatened you, that I swore to sabotage the rocket engines unless you revive Stan. And Rusu's like, now we're going to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need everyone to think you're an asshole anymore, Zeno. Um, there are, of course, people who react in shock about this. Uh, Gen says that Tsukasa is going to accompany Zeno over to Stanley. And Tsukasa's like, yeah, we can say that I'm guarding a VIP as we do this. Uh, and uh, Zeno says, yeah, if Stan turns rebel, then Tsukasa will undoubtedly cause me bodily harm. So they're going to not completely take Stan off the leash, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so everyone's like, hey, this works out really well. The moon mission could be deadly. It's great if we have, you know, another capable soldier up there. Chelsea is the one, because Chelsea has demonstrated that she is very observant about other people's behavior before, uh, that she's the one who asked Ryusui, like, hey, are you sure about this? And Ryusui's like, oh, you know, my shooting skills aren't really up to snuff. And she's like, that's not what I meant. 
Weren't you really, really excited to be going to the moon? And we don't see this scene after that point. We cut yeah. away as they go to revive Stan. And um, so, like, all right, awesome. Uh, Ryusu just kind of shakes it off by saying, like, yeah, who could do a better job than, you know, the best marksman that we know of, you know? And, that, of course, as the greediest person in existence, I desire that. They go and revive Stan. Zeno offers him a cigarette. And Stan takes it and lights it and just says, what's the job? Because he's so fucking cool. <laughs> he knows what's up. Uh... <laughs> So they explain, uh, they don't explain what's going to happen. Instead, Zeno just says, hey, let's say that you shoot a one pound piece of ammunition with initial velocity of 600 meters per second and on the moon surface, blah, 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 and your target is going to do advice one kilometer away. And Stanley just says, I should fire at 0 0.013 degrees. And Senku is like, yeah, the math checks out. He just, I get, I think that his intuition just came up with that number. That's just how good a marksman he is. He just kind of knows where to shoot. And Zeno starts to say, are you up to the task, Stan? And Stanley reaches out and cups Zeno's cheek. In a very heterosexual way. Very <laughs> that, best bro yeah, friends. Yeah, that would. best friends would do. <laughs> Look, I don't know what y'all are talking about freaking out over this. I started watching Arcane. And Vi does that to Caitlyn after they've known each other for two days. So clearly it can't mean anything. Yeah, there's nothing. It's, 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 they were roommates and they died both alone, uh, single, definitely. Yeah. They were just really good friends. On their deathbed, they were like, oh, it's too bad I never met the right woman. And I would have only been interested in women. <laughs> Who I definitely was mostly attracted to. Wink, wink. But bury me with Zeno. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah, so we're cupping each other's groins. <laughs> um so yeah I don't know if we're there are certain series where I you just have to go, I don't know if we're ever just going to get to a point where they just fucking have a same sex couple. But if this is one of the cases where it's not going to happen, this is the most overt I think it's going to be. I don't think we're going... To, based on the fact that Francois has been in this series for so long and they still have not just committed one way or the other to saying what gender Francois identifies as. Uh, non-binary. Yeah, like yeah, whatever it might be. And that is kind of... But, but it's also intentionally put forward enough that it is almost kind of an identity in and of itself at this point, the lack of identity. Like, I feel like that's the same thing here. We're never going to get explicitly Zeno and Stanley saying that they are romantically interested in one another, but we are going to get this and you have to be fucking blind to not pick up on the tones, you know? Well, you see, um, I want to refute a point here and say that one piece has no political messaging. Um, True. so there it's about pirates hunting for treasure. Uh, that's what the one piece is after all. Yes. So it has no political themes to read into. At all. No, there's nothing political about pirates whatsoever. There's nothing, there's nothing about them and their relationship with authority and established governments and police forces that needs to be explored whatsoever. There's none of that in one piece. So yeah, uh, Stanley and Zeno are just really good friends. They just like hang. They just Nick. I I thought. Remember that time I saw you at Magfest? I was like, Nick, it's so good to see you. And I cupped your cheek with my hand very gently. Actually, you might have done that. <laughs> I probably did. We had good times. Magfest was fun. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't want to say you definitely did, but I definitely can't say you definitely didn't. It's, yeah, I, you know what? To remove all doubt would be would be a misstep on our part. <laughs> but yeah, to get to the plot, <laughs> Stanley answers Zeno's question of, are you up to the task by saying, sure, I am. And you just know in that moment, that's just like what they do, what they say before they do it. Like, that's, <laughs> he's looking at him so intensely. Yeah. It's wonderful. I love this. Anyway, we cut then to uh, that night. Uh, Ryusui is doing target practice. They've got this whole, like, mechanism set up. So they've got, you know, targets that are swinging back and forth at a distance. And he's hitting them with the pistol. 
And he's like, hey, no, I'm not going on this mission anymore, but I'm the backup. So I've got to polish my skills. So I'm just doing my duty, right? Uh, Stanley comes across this scene uh, as Francois has come to give uh, to give Ryu Sweeps a meal. And Francois hesitates a moment and comments, you know, this is very like you. You've set aside your personal desire in favor of a greater desire, the victory for mankind. It's very noble of you. But Ryu Sweep cuts them off and says, hey, there's no need to comfort me. And we get more of the shots of the model ship from Ryu Sweep's childhood, the model ship from now. And Ryu Sweep just says, I wanted this so bad, while the moon looms in the background above him. And then the next page, he's just cupping his face and crying, while Francois and Stan both look on. And a little bit more time passes, and Ryu Sweep takes aim with the pistol again, and this time there's four bullseyes all along the row of targets. And Francois is shocked, like, oh my god, at this range you did this? And Ryu Sweep says... Yeah, that wasn't me. And then we get a full page spread of Stanley from his position further away from the targets behind them, and his pistol is smoking. Just to remind you, yeah, this guy's really, really damn good. Yeah. And so now, our three-person team for the away mission is Senku, Kohaku, and Stanley. Considering that we've had two different cases of this member's not going, it's actually this member, let's not Let's not actually say who's actually going on the mission until they're in space. Anymore, right? <laughs> they're at the moon and then, like, go. Hold on. <laughs> the mind. Sawika pops out of the dashboard and is just like, actually, I'm going to be the scientist. <laughs> she just pushes Senku out into the vacuum of space. <laughs> I, I like this chapter a lot. I I I've. I've been noting for a while that I had been kind of disinterested in Dr. Stone because it just felt like we had lost the character and, like, we were just talking about science. And now that we've kind of pushed back all against, like, hey, they've developed everything. We're not dealing with that anymore. And we're now talking about the characters again. The series is a lot more interesting. Like, yeah. I don't really like Ryusuke, but, like, this is an interesting chapter for Ryusuke. I like Stanley coming back. I like how they're developing things. Like, this is just interesting story. Yeah, it's the best chapter of Dr. Stone we've gotten in a while. And things have gotten a lot more interesting the last couple of weeks. And I'm very, very happy to see it. Yeah. All okay. right. Mashal! Let's talk about Mashal, Nick. This is chapter 88. Dot Barrett and the will to succeed. So, Dot... Did his big giant explosion attack, and he says, I'm out of magic power too, so please just stay down. But Rose Quartz and other person are still up. They they surrounded themselves, I guess, with a shield of acid, which seems very dangerous. Uh <laughs> Because acid would just spray <laughs> back, I assume. So maybe there was an acid like a wall of metal behind it and that got okay. melted away. I, I I'll, it's okay. I'll protect us with this barrier of easily disruptible liquid that will burn us if it touches us. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Hang on. Let me put some loose coins and nails in front of this explosion. That'll protect us. I'm going to cover us in barbed wire. That'll protect us from, from being hit by that bomb. Look, it works for Mick Foley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all where everyone takes their logic on how to succeed from the, like, if I light myself on fire, then it won't matter if I get hit with the tombstone, because you'll be burned too, idiot. <laughs> um, so, Matt, uh, Dot starts getting smacked around again. He gets hit with a magnet ball, he gets hit with some acid, boom. He's, he's, he's pretty much done, but he's, he's not quite down yet. He's, he still gets up. Rose Quartz is like, you were right to give up. You would die for sure if you continued. So they combine their powers with the wall of metal... And they cover it in acid. A magnetic wall dripping with acid. And it's impossible to wait, run away from. And Dot says, what the hell? That's messed up. <laughs> uh, Rose Quartz uh, brags, did you know our destinies are determined from birth? But then there's your dingy, dingy mushroom head who's trying to become Divine Visionary without any magic. Can you imagine being that out of touch? I mean, even you must realize he'll never get there. You don't, even, it will never happen. And Dot says, shut up, 
You don't know anything about him, so you can shut the hell up about his destiny. He gives him a big middle Ooh. finger. Oh, he's being rude. He's he's a... You're not supposed to do that. Oh. <laughs> rude boy dot. He gets slammed into the wall of acid and magnets and drops down from the game. Drops down. The Rose Court starts taunting him, being so tell me, was the pain enough to pass out from? It'll be okay, you know. Once I'm in charge of this world, I'll exter exterminate the magic list so no one gets any more funny ideas. But why am I wasting my time on someone who can't even hear me? But Dot gets up. It ain't over yet. I need your key. So he gets slammed into the wall again. But then this time has the big giant metal magnet ball slammed on top of him. And Acid Guy's like, Loot Levis, you utter madman. He ain't getting up again after that beating. But he does. He grabs Rose Quartz's leg. And he's like, no matter what you say, no matter what the world says, you can make fun of him. You can say he'll never do it. But I say he will. I've got faith in him. He's going to become the divine visionary. And as for me, I'm not going to back down and cower in fear while someone trashes my butt. And he uses more magic and it's a bunch of explosions. And it's, oh, Rose Quartz and Acid Guy, get away. Although Acid Guy's a little wounded. And he's like, oh, how did you do that? Wait a minute. The key's gone, and Mash is there. Bum, bum, bum. Dot opened the go the door, and uh, Rose Quartz realized he hung close and even blew himself up to distract from the key being uh, stolen. He really, and then Mash twists his fist and punches Rose Quartz in the chest. And Mash finishes by saying, let's see which of us is eating dirt when this is over. Yay, Dot. I didn't care for this chapter. There were a one too many false finishes where it's like Dot being like, I survived my own explosion. All right, I'm going to slam you into this wall covered in acid. Well, I'm going to get up from that. Well, I'm going to slam you into this wall covered in acid and hit you with the big steel ball. Well, I'm going to get up from that. Well, I'm going to blow myself up and then I'm going to steal the key and still technically be conscious enough to then unlock it. I was like, all right, this is a little, this is a little too many. Like he survived this kind of things. It's like, you know, all right, well, he, he gave him the, the double attitude adjustment, but he still kicked out. So then you hit him with a chair, and then he kicked out. It's like, I, I understand why you think that's an escalation, but it wasn't really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to do the double AA on top of the chair, off the top rope. And then I'll still maybe kick out. You never know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. This chapter was just kind of, yeah, it was all right. It was Dot being kind of kind of cool, but he just kind of like, just just kind of grabs him by the ankle. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of really it. Um, I was kind of hoping when the thing happens where he actually manages to attack back that something more interesting would happen than what actually did. If there had been a bit more of a payoff there in the like last dish effort to grab the keys, or even if he had just like done something much more uh insanely tricky to get them like something we could like see and appreciate yeah then that would have had given me a different impression of all this but with that said let's move on to the elusive samurai chapter 42 mikoshi 1335 the kakushi is attacking people from a fucking palanquin that's got walls and he thinks that he's hot shit. Because he's like, I've got all these warriors who are defending me, and I kill everyone from safety. This is great. It's my own invention. I battle Mikoshi. And Gojira's like, what the fuck? That's not how palanquins are supposed to be used. <laughs> You're supposed to hide away from everything from them and just... Makes give signals for, while you're standing at a from a high perch, way far away from the battle. But Fubuki says, "Yeah, but there are some advantages to it because it makes for an attractive target, despite the fact that it is actually really heavily defended, and because everyone's kind of focusing on that as a target, they get attacked by all the other soldiers, and then anyone who gets close enough, he just shoots them really easily because they're framed by the window and they're close, so he can't miss. So there are actually a lot of advantages to it, and it and." So Fubuki analyzes the way that it's causing the tide of the battle to turn, the way that Hoshina's men are concentrating on stuff, 
and he's like, okay, we can't fall for these weird unorthodox tactics. And he starts to ride off. And Tokyuki warns him, hey, don't be hasty. But Fubuki says, don't worry. I'm merely taking information to Hoshina. And we get some stuff from the Kakushi at this moment as he's like, ah, this is great. This is great. This is all for my world. No, for the Mikado's world. And we see that when the Kakushi was first made, the Kakushi, he really, really, really didn't want the position because he was like, I'll be killed in this position. I can't rule these weird people. And uh, the Emperor says, even if I command it. And the Kakushi responds with, look, my clan's got, you know, low ranking nobility originally. You know, my, my lineage and my abilities don't allow me to have this position. So why have you chosen me for this post? And apparently, the current emperor is kind of crazy. <laughs> he gives this very passionate speech about how spirit is required for men to transform the times. And he says, ah, back during the previous shogunate, you were wondering why all the other nobles were indolent and groveled for the warrior houses and lusted for personal gain. You believe that you can make a change for the better. And I saw that passion and ambition. It caught my attention back then. You have no great lineage, no major accomplishments. You're kind of ugly. You smell weird. People don't like you. But you have a spirit that would touch the sky. And that is why I give you Shinano. Go, Kiyohara, and rule Shinano with spirit for the world I will create. And Kakushi got all fired up, and this apparently drastically shifted his personality to being an aggressive dickbag that we have known since he was first introduced. And uh, so, yeah, he's just thinking to himself, like, the, well, he's not actually thinking to himself, he's getting, you know, narration saying, yeah, this was actually, like, how a lot of stuff happened in these times, because the Emperor Godaigo was very very charismatic and a lot of nobles who had previously not entered into combat would take up arms and would get involved in the battles so this is an example of that uh however as kukushi is getting really 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 revved up you know shooting people from his safety and stuff all of a sudden the palanquin starts to kind of topple a little bit as oh hoshina's forces have adjusted they're shooting the people who are <laughs> who are carrying the palanquin <laughs> Each time one of them falls, someone steps into their place in order to take pick up the slack. But Fubuki's analysis is, hey, you know, a lot of these people are kind of having to carry the palanquin with their dominant hand and fight with their non-dominant one. And every time that one goes down, a replacement has to step in. And if a, an inexperienced warrior steps in, then that's a weakness we can exploit. And the longer this goes on, the more the perch of the Kukushi is getting wobbled back and forth until eventually Hoshina and... Um, one of the other generals, I can't remember his name. They charge in, smash the the palanquin with their horses, and topple it over, and the Kagushi falls out, and his hat falls off. Oh. oh no, he's truly fallen now. And they do this thing about like how only gods ride in Mikoshi, which is not an aspect of things from this period of history that I understand, but maybe like that it has to do with like the level of nobility that is allowed to use them but anyway they've captured him now they've got him at spear and sword point and uh that's it they've got, they've got him but more stuff is going on tokyuki spots something flashing in the mountains and he wonders briefly if it's battle gear uh so he rushes off on horseback and he says i've got to tell shinomiya to get ready to flee or he may suffer a surprise attack from the rear but both Genba and Kojiro are like, hey, I don't think that this is the case. I mean, like, there's no way that, you know, a proper army could get through there. But Tokyuki says, I think I know who it is. A resourceful commander who's crafty, careful, and skilled at, at surprise attacks. And sure enough, I'd forgotten his name, but it's the warrior that Tokyuki had the duel with that he Aunt cut dude. his wrist and stuff. Yeah. So he's back. Bum, bum, bum. It's yeah, interesting. The big thing that it's it's a lot of like collage of things happening in this arc. We've we've seen quite a few characters show back up. Um, I don't know if I could specifically say that this is like a terrifying development, but it is interesting. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. 
mean, they did beat the guy the last time yeah. they fought him. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's nice that we have another villain that I guess is, you know, we know more about. Yeah. And, and getting involved here. Let's Set wrap this up. One piece. Yeah. Chapter 34, Sanji versus Queen. Uh, so we start things off in the Skull Dome, seeing some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, <laughs> so we need to set up something that's going to happen later on. One of the, um, I believe, Pleasure Women yes. uh, is running around as everything is on fire, as the flames are spreading. Uh, her name is Osome, and they're warning everyone else is warning her, you're going to get hurt, but she says, I still can't find Chuji. Oh, no. So they're trying to find a way to escape. Meanwhile, Momonosuke is still trying to prevent uh, the island from falling on the flower capital. Okay. Uh, he, he, he page about the thing we knew he was doing. He, well, he, specifically now he's able to do it. He has grasped the knack of Kaido's flame cloud, so he's able to start doing it. Then we cut to Queen and Sanji still duking it out. Queen utilizes... Starts using attacks that the the Germa use, uh, specifically that Sanji's siblings have used in battle, and he's witnessed. But of course, they're all his own versions of them, which means that he replaces uh, one of the words in the attack name with Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's identical. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, and so you know he's using like Ichiji's uh, laser eye beams and stuff, and the and a version of the electroshock Henry Blazer thing uh, and then he starts bragging about how he knows these moves and he's been saving them until after Sanji transformed and he's like yeah see Judge's sons are like the amalgamation of all his scientific tech if I had beaten you in a pulp while you wore that suit I could have proven something to Judge that I am the superior scientist stealth black and Sanji's like I don't care I, I just don't care <laughs> Queen snatches Sanji out of the air and he just and he claims I played dumb about it earlier, but the truth is I've researched and tested all of Germa science, which is very important for later on. Uh, so he was not in fact shocked by all the stuff that Sanji was demonstrating uh, with the invisibility and the iron body stuff. He says I can recreate any move that your brother that you brothers can do, uh, and uh, Queen starts. Tossing Sanji all around the building, dragging him through walls and floors. Which, Sanji... as we've established in Freddy vs. Jason, is the coolest way to fight an opponent. Is to just pick them up, slam them into a wall, and drag them through the walls. <laughs> Sanji eventually gets sick of this and kicks through the, the, the mechanical arm that Queen's got him grabbed in. And Queen just goes, curse you! My hand! <laughs> And he calls Sanji a snotty little brat. Sanji says, I warned you not to say their names around me. And Queen says in response, Oh, so there's no such thing as freedom of speech. <laughs> it is the moment where you're like, Alright, I, I knew Queen was a lot of things, but now I know exactly the kind of person Queen is. <laughs> oh, suddenly I just can't talk anymore. Am I going to get cancelled? Just because the say I like hitting women, am I going to get cancelled now? Spoiler. <laughs> Sanji kicks him in the stomach and knocks him backwards uh, and says, See, don't always assume you have the upper hand. There's no way the attack I landed on you earlier didn't do lasting damage. And we've been fighting for a while. You're really banged up too. I've already accepted my fate. I'm not the same person you fought back under the dome. But then, Queen takes a breath and disappears. He goes invisible and says, then show me how different you really are. The next one's your specialty, stealth black. Sanji, however, is not phased, and he vanishes too, which shocks Queen momentarily. <laughs> I do you love Queen's face. <laughs> yeah. Whoa! I like how, like, his eyes aren't drawn the same way as the rest of his body, which makes me think they actually became visible. <laughs> <laughs> For the <laughs> prom <laughs> moment. <laughs> Then he quickly realizes, oh wait, he doesn't have the suit on, so he's just invisible because he's moving so quickly. 
So the moment that he's visible again is the moment he's out of stamina. Stupid decision, boy. And in that moment, oh dear. So, Osome has spotted Chuji, who is her pet mouse. And so he's scurrying around and, and she's like, oh my gosh, you're all right. And she beckons over to him. Hey, come on. We don't know when they're going to start fighting again. Hurry over here. And so Queen's like, Osome, so that hussy is on her feet again. <laughs> How dare she turn down my patronage all those dozens of times? <laughs> it really, it's a moment where you're like, yeah, all right, Queen is a real shitbag. Hey, <laughs> why are you calling her a hussy if you're that interested in her? And B... Because he's been turned away dozens of times. Because Nick Queen is an incel, so the woman is the problem. She is the reason why he can't get laid. <laughs> With Kimura Saki gone, you're my number one girl, Osome. <laughs> they said you were off work due to a headache this morning, which made it very suspicious that you were walking around your spot. <laughs> I wish he, I wish he had like put on a little Sherlock hat when he's happy. He's like, you. I was told earlier that you were had a headache and you couldn't walk around, but here you are right now, looking around for your pet mouse. Suspicious? I think so. Classic woman to lie. Was my divine punishment earlier not enough? We'll see how you like another one, <gasps> because it turns out Sanji didn't go crazy and hurt a woman. That was just Queen. Being an asshole while invisible. Yeah. <laughs> and so Sanji says to himself, as he dashes up into the air and prepares for his next attack, an exoskeleton, muscle and speed, all of which increase strength. Add the color of arm and hockey I've developed in my exoskeleton, and my legs are tougher, capable of supporting even hotter flames. And he declares his next attack, Ifrit Hamle. And he dashes forward through the air, going faster, heavier, and says, The mystery is solved. You did that, didn't you, Queen? You miserable piece of human scum. And he kicks Queen in the back of the head with collier coup. And Queen becomes visible briefly. And then he just follows up with more attacks. Kicks and kicks and French words. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to try and read them all because I don't know these words. Before declaring... Oh, but, but, but Mark Wahlberg could come in to read these words for you, Nick. Oh, basis caught a blast. Pal around pound. Jamail if big tech blitz. <laughs> Tendron ten deer answer. Flanchette flyer. Quewewe crippler. Piore puker. Jarrett Jarrer, and of course, Bleth Burst. And before which Sanji declares, now fly, sicko. And he indeed sends Queen flying with the sound effect. Bleh! <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that presumably is the end of this fight. And I, I absolutely love that we get uh, a callback to... Maybe the coolest moment of Sanji ever in combat, which was him beating the shit out of Kurobe with just a sequence of uh, like kicks over and over again. Um, I really do like kind of like the speed of Sanji's kicks and everything like that. So I think that's really cool. I'm a little disappointed if this is the climax, which people are saying they don't think it is. And I don't have a reason to believe it's not with the pacing of one piece recently this definitely feels like a definitive move to end this fight um i was almost hoping for something else but i think we might be at the point where like evolu like i don't know if it's supposed to be like the new version of ifrit jambe gives him lightning on his feet as well or if that's stylistic per se mm. um but it, it it's one thing where I'm like, I was hoping we might see something more crazy, but at the same time, like, it is also still pretty cool, I guess. So, I think that this was very much, like, supposed to be, you know, yeah, Queen has a bunch of gadgets, gadgets that give Sanji some trouble, but when Sanji awakens to his tr true potential, that's just when he just 
completely destroys him. Yeah. Uh, and you were meant to just kind of get over like, okay, Sanji is way more, is way stronger. Um, and I imagine that Zoro might have a bit of a tougher fight with King based on just the way that he's been getting his ass kicked up until this point. But we might also see a similar turn in the near future where, okay, he's mastered all three of his yeah. swords now. And that just puts him on an, on a higher level. Where he yeah. Him easily. I, I think that's so, where we're going. But yeah, that was fun. Let's finish things by saying what our favorite chapters were. What's who is our MVP? Uh, I think my favorite series this week. I am gonna give it to. I'm gonna give it to One Piece. I really liked One Piece this week. I thought it was a fun, cool chapter. A lot of action, a lot of good stuff, and uh, it was it was a good time. Uh, I am going to say that my favorite chapter was Doctor Stone. I liked it uh, throughout, and I loved the uh, character stuff that we got out of both Rusui and a little bit from Stanley. It was just a really enjoyable experience all the way through. So. All right. Uh, my character week is going to be Deputaku, because he was the number one in the poll, and he absolutely deserved oh, yeah. every part of that. Fuck yeah, it's my boy. Um, I don't like doubling up. Uh, otherwise, I might say, uh, you know, either Rusui or Stanley from, from Dr. Stone. But honestly... Outside of that, this week, I feel as though there's not a lot of characters that I feel like, okay, yeah, this was definitely the best one. So, yeah, fuck it. Nabutaku won. <laughs> <He's number one. laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, the audience, by the way, picked... Hold on a second. I moved away and lost it. Uh, Magu-chan as their chapter of the week, and Azuma as their character of the week, also for Magu-chan. So... I, I do understand that. He does have the big cool moment at the end. But yeah. he's only number nine in the popularity polls. Yeah, <laughs> not, 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 there's only one number one. There's only one. All right. That will do it for Weekly Mog Recap, everyone. Although stay tuned because I'm going to declare what our next recommendation is going to be. <sighs> um, so we're, we uh, want to thank everyone who joined us for Weekly Mog Recap here live on twitch.tv slash reloadc. We usually start the show around 7.30-ish Eastern time. We did start a little bit late because Nick was grumpy about something that happened in real life, but it's okay. We're all better. We're all better now. Um, uh, it's nothing serious. Trust me. Everything, everything's fine. But I was really annoyed about it. I, I would be too <laughs> if pterodactyls attacked my house. It's fucking assholes. <laughs> They're the shitheads. Stay in your place. That's why you've got. To <laughs> oh, oh, Nick. <laughs> Nick's a little bit prejudiced against them. He's like, the pterodactyls would be fine if they just went back to whatever country they were from. <laughs> Look, they've got a giant. They've got a giant facility literally right next door. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they can pull back their crests and shoot out blasts whatever they want over there, as we all know, do pterodactyls do. Just don't shoot the prey that it happens to be perched in front of my fucking window. Yeah. I've had to replace it so many times. Come on. <laughs> so anyways. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, if you want to stay tuned to exactly when the show is going to go live on Twitch.tv, however, you can check us out on social media. On Twitter, we are at Boomer Podcast, at Rolo T, and at Nick F. Time. Uh, you can also check us out in our Discord server where we discuss the chapters as they come out each week. We also discuss the series that we are taking as a recommendation as we work our way through it. Speaking of recommendations, if you would like to make one, you can check out the sheet that is maintained by Ninja X3i. There is a long list of everything that has been recommended so far, that we have covered so far. If you see something that's already been recommended, hey, put your name down next to it so that we know that there is uh, interest among more people that want us to cover that. That is one of the reasons why we check out certain series. Mm -hmm. uh, we also want to thank everyone who helps us make the podcast what it is. Milo Jack Stillitz and Wizzy Cheddar who created the opening sequence that you can see on the YouTube versions of Weekly Manga Recap. And Steve Mann who does occasional title cards for the same video versions of stuff. You can check out his artwork Wherever boobs are, I would be drawn on the internet, including his Twitter account, Steve Manart. It's a good account. Yes. It is. I'm just saying it. It is. He's a good artist. Yeah. So. Uh, what else do I have to say? Uh, thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon, patreon.com slash weekly manga recap. You allow us to create bonus content for you guys to enjoy, including the monthly other recap, where Chris talks about the stuff in Shonen Jump that we don't talk about weekly manga recap. 
and uh, gives opinions on what would have been the MVP potentially yes. on the Victor series. Uh, I, I, I had a big monthly other recap episode I just recorded. I talked about a bunch of ep- chapters and I added uh, Four Nights of the Apocalypse to it. So if you want to mm-hmm. know what's going on with that, I talked about PPPPP, which has both simultaneously been fucking bonkers. I definitely should have used the veto on that. And at the same time, has been kind of good. And I will fully support that. So stay tuned for that. Listen to those thoughts. They're wild. Hot takes everywhere. Yeah. Gotta love it. Uh, and check out the podcast wherever it is available. Weeklymongerecap.poppy.com, iTunes, uh, Spotify, anywhere you can listen to podcasts in general, you will be able to find Weekly Manga Recap. Including for next week, when we will be discussing... Da, 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 da. I don't want to actually drum on my desk, so I'm making the sound with my mouth. Ba, la, 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 la. Thank you. I think our son is gay. Oh, oh. The Putaku has finally accepted himself. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good uh, news. I was, making, I was not making an actual comment about oh. the name of the series. Oh. It's been getting uh, a fair amount of attention very recently. Uh, it's uh, a very short form series, so I think that this is something that we'll be able to knock out much more quickly than Jugo Karaku, and we'll, we should have that fairly shortly for you guys. Hell yeah, buddy! All right, that is it. We are gone. They can't stop us now. There goes Nick. He disappeared. He's, he's fighting those pterodactyls. 